You'll have to excuse me for one other little thing too. <laughs> the first reading today from Romans is, as it turns out, from a different lectionary to what the Australian lectionary is. And so my message is also from Romans, but not that one. <laughs> but not that one. It was actually from Romans 6, 1 to 11, rather than 5, 12 to whatever it was. Ah, never mind. What's the scripture say? The word never goes out without being rewarded in some way. Okay, the Apostle Paul, in the reading that we should have heard from his letter to the church in Rome, asks what sounds like an extreme rhetorical question. He says, should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? Should we draw attention to God's grace by living in such an unwholesome way that God's grace will be all the more necessary? Now, it's very easy for us to say, of course not. It sounds like a question that no one would take seriously. But I wonder if there's more to the question than first meets the eye. You see, our lives are not just the things we say or do, our lives are also how we relate to what we live in, to the families and the communities, and indeed the country, the institutions that we find ourselves immersed in. And most of our families and communities and institutions and countries, sadly to say, are no longer shaped too much by the values of the gospel. Instead, they're largely shaped by the values of the world. Is that not so? Often the value of each person is measured by their productivity, that the worth of any organisation is measured by its efficiency, and that true meaning and happiness is found in earning and spending. In a system that goes by various names, perhaps, it might often be called economic rationalisation. You would be hard-pressed to find any major institution in our society or government or business or even the church where the people in authority do not bend the knee at the altar of this principle. Christianity has always called such values idolatry. It doesn't mean that everything it says or does is wrong, but it does mean that the governing principle around which a person or a group or an organisation structures their life is in fact idolatrous if it doesn't have the Lord at the centre and the top. In other words, three words, it is sin. And so those of us who seek to follow Jesus have always been called to make a choice. Will you live in that, a.k.a. sin, or will you live in opposition to that, a.k.a. the life of Jesus? So how should we live? Should we just accept that those around us offer daily sacrifices to those idols and we quietly get on with our lives without worrying too much about it, cooperating with the idolatry, not offending anybody. That's the buzzword these days, isn't it? Somebody gets offended. You feeling offended at the moment? Oh, good, I can go on. We're not meant to rock the boat, are we? But we must remember that God's grace is big enough to save us no matter what. So what does that mean? 
Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound, was the question. Well, Paul is in no doubt about the answer because he says, no way. And he explains then that we have been baptised into Jesus Christ. It's all or nothing. The colic sort of spelt spelt that out fairly well this morning. In baptism, we have died with him. We have died to sin. Died to the life that we once lived. The life enslaved to the ways of sin and every idolatrous system with its dehumanising creeds of wealth and earning and spending. And having died with Christ, we have been raised with him to resurrection life, to walk in radical newness of life, a totally different way of living from being in slavery to sin. That might not answer the question of how we live it. Jesus never promised it would be easy. If anyone can find that scripture reference, I'd like to see it. In fact, he said that we had to take up our cross and follow. And he also said this rather un- this unsettling thing your foes, I'm paraphrasing, your enemies, your foes, will as likely be members of your own household. But he also didn't say that you could just ignore the need to decide and assume that if you sing Amazing Grace on Sundays, that that grace will bring you home even though your life is shaped by another system for six and a half days of the week. We can no longer, I put it to you, live in the systems and patterns that we once lived in or we might still be living in. We can no longer live at peace with those who will only accept a peace that is grounded in allegiance to their values and their idolatries. We need to know what we're going to stand for and we need to be very intentional about the way we live it out. So what is it? It's a stand for love and justice in the face of fear and oppression. It's a stand for communion in the face of rampant individualism and divisiveness. It's a stand for self-offering in the face of selfishness and exploitation. It's a stand for listening to the voice of God in the face of the cacophony of voices that would drown out the truth. It is a stand for welcome and hospitality in the face of exclusivity. It's a stand for non-conformity in the face of forces of the mass market consumerism. It's a stand for courageously doing as Jesus would do in the face of the forces of death. It's a stand for the gentle nurturing of faith in the face of cynicism and despair. It's a stand for thankfulness in the face of bitterness and greed It may not get you arrested, but as I was saying before, it's quite likely to arouse suspicion and opposition and anger and tension from those around you, even from those closest to you, your family. No one who lives in the real world, and we all do, we have to, can deny the vice-like grip that society has over systems and structures and communities in which we live our lives. Now, I don't want to get too political here, but in the last X number of years, how much our society has changed. The loud voices, the squeaky wheels, the protest marches, 
hearts, they get listened to. The still, small voice of God, not so much. Not so much. And so rules and regulations and government has all changed in the last 10 years or so. And you and I might wonder whether it's for the better or for the worse. So how do we break free from it? I don't know exactly how to give any thing in your particular case. I'm just another pilgrim on the road with you, searching for the pathways of truth and integrity. I'm pretty sure that none of us will ever manage to do it alone. What I am increasingly convinced of, and why I'm here with you worshipping the God who raised Christ from the dead, is that grace of God revealed in Jesus and lived by his spirit is powerful enough to break that grip that the world has on it. God has destined us for freedom, freedom from slavery to sin, freedom from idolatrous habits, free from consumerism, free from whatever you want to call it, God has destined us for freedom and a new life and the power of God's Spirit which is given to us in our baptism and able to lead us there. So the long and the short of it is we can't break free by ourselves. We can only break free in the power and the love of the one who died for us, Jesus the Christ. Amen.